Awo, Shalom, Rastafari. Now, in continuing, we were speaking about the famine that was in the land and how Father Abraham, how he chose to go down into Egypt. This was not under divine command, but this was a choice that he made and some of the background of famine. And to consider that this was the promised land. This was the land that, that God had promised to Abraham. And, and what occurred? A famine occurred in that land. Now, it doesn't say whether Abraham doubted or anything like that, but that would give a lot of people pause. Like when we talk about Ethiopia, what's the first thing people say about Ethiopia? Same thing. Oh, there's always famine. People are starving and the big bellies and everything else. And we say, well, that's the promised land. They say, that's the okay, the promised land. The promised land is milk and honey. And then you see right here, there was what? Verse 10, it says there was what? There was famine in the land, and there was a famine in the land. There was a what? A famine in the land. Now, some say it was in that land alone. This was a further test in that God, Ha Elohim, had bidden him to go to the Kana'anu, to go to Kana'an, and now he had to leave it, or now he chose to leave it, or really the decision was, are you going to endure this and rely on Yahweh's blessing, or are you going to leave? He chose to leave. Now, some say, and I kind of agree with this, um, this Hebrew, Hebraic, Judaic interpretation, that there's some, some sin that must be ascribed to Abraham. Yes, he was a righteous man. Yes, he's the father of the faith. You understand? But some error in going down to Egypt, for he should have trusted in Ha Elohim who could save him wherever he was. Now, we have to also understand that. Although there is a commission on us to prepare ourselves and to come out, there should be not the fret and the fear and the phobia if we are still in a land that's not our own and it's a, it's a tribulation time that Yahweh can preserve us even through tribulation. You see, that's the spiritual, that's the metaphysical approach. Now, this whole incident, it foreshadowed the future. This whole incident concerning Abraham, it foreshadowed the future. Abraham, he went down to Egypt because of the famine, right? And this is the interpretation that the Egyptians robbed him of his wife, for which they were punished with great plagues, that the Egyptians of this particular time and particular period robbed him of his wife, and they were punished with great plagues. Now, Abraham was then loaded with gifts because they recognized that this man, this black Osarian, this black Assyrian, he has some powers. The, the, all the gods was working on his behalf, we need to give him gifts as a, as a kind of a living God or a living representative, this black Osarian, Osirian, Abraham. Give him gifts and Pharaoh charged men to see that he left the country. He actually charged men, make sure he gets out of here. You understand, with all the gifts. So he, in a sense, left with what? With great substance which is the prophecy upon us, the, Lord, the once lost but now found Beta Israel. Similarly, the Beta Israel, they went down to Egypt because of famine. There they were downpressed or oppressed, and their wives taken from them. This sounds all kind of very similar, doesn't it? This being the purpose of Pharaoh's edict to spare the daughters. Pharaoh said, spare the daughters and kill the sons. It's like this spiritual Egypt that we're in. So the Abraham story with the famine, and when we look at the famine in the promised land, we look at the famine in the Horn of Africa and Ethiopia, when we look at this spiritual Egypt, killing the sons, aborting the sons, saving the daughters, all of this that we're going through right now, we can see that it is one and the same and that the Torah gives us the wisdom to overcome this. Now, the Egyptians were punished by great plagues. It's like what's going on here in America. 
Some people don't recognize that what's happening in America is great plagues are happening because Yah is saying, let this people go. Let this people go. But the scriptures warn us, even from Abraham's time and from this particular Torah portion, that the what iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So we have to figure out, well, who are the Amorites? Could the Amorites be the Americans? You know what I'm saying? The Egyptians were punished by great plagues, and subsequently the Israelites departed with great wealth and were also hastened out of the country. What's been the big topic lately that, like, some people seem to be upset that it seems as though, not all blacks, but blacks have been getting wealthy in America. Now, however, one want to say, we have to recognize the foundation of America is on bloodshed anyway and, and exploitation from the beginning. You know what I'm saying? So if somebody in America exploits or some bloodshed and gains some wealth and they happen to be black, why is that different than the founding fathers of America? That's basically being a good American. You know, if you know American history and the founding fathers. But the fact is that it seems like a lot of folks are upset that black people seem to be, some of them seem to be rather wealthy. Not all. Some are still struggling, but some have been able in some ways to make it. You know, like when Obama and his wife were, at least Obama was running for presidency, they said, oh, they got all this money, and he made all this money off his book, and she got all this money, and they are like millionaires or whatever like that. And, you know, some little cornball, some little cornball Amorite racist, they're a little bit upset about that. But this is just a fourth shadowing, my brothers and sisters. So Jah is not upset with us having wealth. You understand? It's whether the wealth serves us and mainly serves him and therefore serves, serves us or whether we are serving the wealth. You know, in other words, does our wealth worship us or are we worshiping our wealth? You know, getting our priorities, our house spiritually in order. So he sojourned there. You understand? Know sojourned there. There was a sojourning, a sojourning that took place there. Now, as we move forward, you understand? Know as we move forward to chapter 13, we have Abram, he returns to the land. There's a return to the land. And the altar. And this altar that he built was at Beit El. Beit El. Beit El. Beit House of El. House of God or House of the True God. So he builds the altar. Then we have Abram's separation from Lot. Abram's separation from Lot, which is also a very interesting story as we as as we mentioned before and as we study it we'll see Lot's first step in backsliding. Lot had a second step in backsliding, you know, and then we'll find further um backsliding. You see, um when the Bible says that Lot was righteous, it was because of who he was associated with. He was associated with Abraham. It's just like we have righteousness in the Moshiach in our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yehoshua HaMoshiach. The New Testament teaches us that and tells us that, that it's because of our faith in him, you understand, know that we have righteousness before Ha Elohim, not because all of a sudden we become righteous and perfect people, but we have right, we're in a right relationship because we receive the one whom he has sent and the one who he has appointed. So we receive the Almighty through receiving the one who he has sent, and that puts us in, legally speaking, and yes, the law. You understand? There is the law of God, the law that, that controls and governs the universe, you understand? And even our heart and mind and our involuntary functions are all governed by Jah's law. So we have righteousness because of Yehoshua, because of Gietachin Jesus Christos, the same way that Lot or Lot had also righteousness, not because he was a holy moly. A lot of people say, how could Lot be righteous? He wanted to give his daughters to the Sodomites. 
You understand? Instead of the angels that had come to visit him being given to the sodomites do, God knows what with. They were a bunch of batimen, you know, as people have assumed and as, as, as they believe. So how could, and he, had, he, he got drunk and, his, and had sex with his daughters and produced a whole bastard race of people. How could he be righteous? He was righteous, as they say, by association. You've heard the phrase before, guilty by association. You've heard that before. It's a legal phrase. It's, it's an ancient legal phrase that go beyond white supremacy. White supremacy, when they crawled out the cave, they learned a little bit of law, and they learned things like that, which are just principles, creation principles. So you can be guilty by association. Therefore, you can also be righteous by association. And this is the case of Lot. It took me a while to even comprehend it too. I said, you know, I was going over the scripture and it says, and the righteous Lot, and the righteous Lot. So I will go back and read over Lot's story. I'm going to be like, Lot was righteous? How was Lot righteous? You know, and, and you know, in prayer and meditation, it came time that he, he was righteous the same way we are righteous. We are righteous by association. We are righteous by association with our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Getach and Jesus Christos. And Lot or Lot was righteous because of his association with Abraham, that black Osirian or Osarian or Syrian, right? But let's touch a little bit on the sister wife, the sister wife point. I just wanted to, to, to say a little word about the um, the sister wife points. So now we've touched on the fact that famine has struck the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt. He asked Sarah or Sarai. He asked her to say that she was his sister, so that the Egyptians would not kill him. He felt the Egyptians would kill him. Very interesting. There's much more to that story or allegation. Now, the, as you said, the racist Jews, the OJs, the other Jews, the German and the Polish Jews, in their homage, they say because the Egyptians were dark-skinned and ugly. See, this is what we say, that they only have half of the truth. Yes, they were dark-skinned. They were black. They wasn't white. Even, even the Jews admit that part. So this little bit of racism, racist footnote, in the Jewish um, uh, synagogue Torah, of course we don't like that ugly part, you understand? But we've, we've heard much worse, even though it just shows that their heart is not quite right with Hashem, but still it proves something else. It proves that the Egyptians were black people. They didn't say the Egyptians were light, were, were white, were so forth and so on. So, so then you might have to ask them the question, well, if the Egyptians were dark-skinned and ugly, how could not the brothers of Joseph not recognized Joseph. Either they would have recognized that he was not dark-skinned, or perhaps he was, or they would recognize that he wasn't ugly. But we haven't gotten to that stage yet, have we? Now, anyway, when they entered Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's courtiers, they, they, they uh, praised her beauty to Pharaoh, and she was taken into Pharaoh's palace. Pharaoh took Sarai as his wife. Because of her, Avram, he acquired sheep, oxen, donkeys, slaves, camels. But Ha Elohim had afflicted Pharaoh or those rulers of that time. In other words, he afflicted that administration. See, we, we can't think that all Egypt was the same Egypt in the sense that all of the same kind of, some were faithful, some of them were Yahweh's. And some of them were antichrist. You understand? Some of them, some of them were our people, and some of them were other people's. It's like now we got a black president. You understand? Some say he might be Muslim. Who knows? You know, might have a Jewish president. Who knows? You understand? But when they say Pharaoh, Pharaoh is like to say the White House. A lot of people confuse that. They say, "What's the name of Pharaoh?" You mean what's the name of his administration, or what's the name of the king? The more correct question would be, what's the name of the king? But Elohim afflicted, Hashem afflicted Pharaoh and his household with mighty plagues, Genesis 12, 16 to 17. Pharaoh, he questioned Abraham why he had not told Pharaoh that Sarai was Abraham's wife. 
but had said that she was his sister. In Genesis 12, 18, um, 18 to uh, 19, and Pharaoh returned Sarai to Abram and had his men take them away or take them to the border with their possessions, so forth, and, 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 and so on. Now, what's interesting is that when Abram left Egypt, it says that he went to the south. That's very key. Because if he left and went to the north, if the border there, he would have been in the Mediterranean. It didn't say that he went to the northeast and crossed the Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula. But he went to the south, what the Jews call the Negev. But the real Negev, the real south, we'll find out, was Ethiopia. The real south was Ethiopia. So we can see that even in Egypt there was divided kingdoms. There was a northern kingdom and there was a southern kingdom, or there was lower Egypt and there was upper Egypt. Some say that he left lower Egypt and went to upper Egypt, but we will get into that hopefully even more. Now, what's interesting is the conversation between Pharaoh and and and. And 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 Abraham, Abraham or Abram, the, the 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 conversation between the two of them, because um, it says that and Pharaoh called Abraham and said, "What is this that thou hast done to me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now behold." Now, therefore, behold, thy wife, take her and go thy way. Now, some expand this to say that how the pharaoh or the, the king, the ruler at that time, you know, one like, what kind of people do you think we were? Well, um, I'm not going to even go into that part right now because that part is probably not really. Let's just stick with the text. Now, we want to touch on the sister-wife thing, the sister-wife thing, because now, Abraham is an example, and if we would understand, for example, uh, the New Testament, when we go to New Testament scriptures, turn your Bibles to 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 9 and 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, and there's a curious thing that Huaria Paulos, Paul, says right here. Chapter 9, verse 5. He says, Have we not power to say authority to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles and as the brethren of the Lord or Cephas? Now, this is, this is, this is kind of interesting because when we look at it, in the Amharic, it says, sister, our wife, our wife's sister. Now, why is that so important? Now, in, in Abraham's case, some say, well, the reason why he, called, he could call her sister is because it was the same father but different mother. Some say that, that they had the same father, different mother. This is all looking physically. You know, a lot of people are looking at this physically and saying that, well, um, Tara or Terach was Sarai's father, but they had different mothers. This is how some Jews and others explain it. But we want to take the high road, the, the, the spiritual road. The spiritual road would be in the same way that Huari Alos uses this here, where he's actually speaking about, he's vindicating his apostleship. He's vindicating his apostleship, where he says, don't we, don't I and I have authority to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as the other apostles, and as the brethren of Adonai, or of the Lord, and Cephas, and Cephas, or Kepha, is actually, that's Petros, Peter, Peter, like them, many of us too, we have Babylonian, or Greek, or Eurocentric names as well as Hebrew names. So Peter's Greek name was Petros, 
or his koina name was Petros, and his Hebrew name, his Hebrew name was Kepha or Kephas. Some would read it as Cephas, but it's really Kephas. Now, the real background of this goes to what Christ says. Christ explains it when he speaks of the new relationships. The new relationships in St. Matthew. St. Matthew chapter 12 verses 46 to verse 50. And I'll read it for you. It says, While they were yet, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Verse 47, Then one said to him, Behold, look and see, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said to him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Christ asked this. Now, of course, Christos, the Mushik, he knew who his mother and brethren were. Didn't he? But he's trying to explain something a little bit deeper. And let's understand this in the case of sister wife or sister as wife in the sense of relationship. It's like in ancient Egypt. And we're going to use Egypt as another example here. In ancient Egypt, we hear that pharaohs sometimes married their, their sisters. You know, and people are like, oh, that's nasty. But what people don't know is that they married their sisters, but they had children with others. And people say, well, what was, what was that for? It was because of the culture, the culture of passing on that royal, that royal authority, sultan, sultane, and passing that on, and, and in a sense keeping that royal authority, the throne, who, who ruled the throne. So it was a, a royal marriage but they did not procreate. You understand? In civilized societies like that, they did not procreate with each other. So that's another example of sister as wife, one's literal sister as wife for political or royal prerogatives and to keep certain royal prerogatives according to their priesthood, their culture, their interpretation, so forth and so on. But now Christ here, the Moshiach here, gives us, something very spiritual or metaphysical now to understand, where it says, and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, behold, look and see, look and see, look and see, my mother and my brethren. In verse 50, he adds something which is significant, very significant often has been overlooked. It says, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, to say the will of the true God, the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. He first just asks, Well, who's my mother and my brethren? Now when he, he first qualifies the relationship, this is what's the key. He's qualifying a new relationship. In other words, not just a wife as, 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 as a woman that you might sexually fancy, but this, this woman who is your wife or your wifey or your wife, for us of, of the spirit, for us of the covenant, she is also in the covenant. She is seeking to do the will of our Father, of the true God. So even if she was not your personal wife, she will still be your sister by faith. Because remember, Abraham is the father of the faithful. He is the father of the faithful. So what we see right here is the newness of relationship. We see the newness of relationship right here as well as a qualification. It's given us a very important key and qualification of relationship. This is why this particular subject matter here of, of, of sister as wife or one's wife should be your sister spiritually speaking. 
see that was that, that would actually um, help solve a lot of problems that that we have family wise and relationship wise and a lot of the drama a lot of the drama that many of us have experienced you know if if we first assess and and sisters do the same too please do you understand uh, if you're one of the faith then you have to ask is this really my brother is this really my spiritual brother is this one seeking to do the will of my father you understand not just talking shit but seeking to do the will of my father you understand of of the true father of Jah, if you please Jah rastafari the king of kings and his christ then if so then this is your brother husband as sister as wife so it's it's a very important teaching and it may seem like something small. Some might say, oh, that's a, small, that's a small point there. That's a small matter there. It may be a small matter, but when the dramas come along, <laughs> you know, some of us know drama. You know, if we would have only known these things, if one would have preached or taught these things and taken the time, you know, to share these things, if they even knew these things. Now, what is important right here? You understand? Know what, what is important right here? And there's a footnote down here that we think is also um, a key because um, it says, doctrinally, verse 43 continues verse 22. So it says, verse 43 continues that's a little before our reading verse 43 there's a whole section here that we in chapter 12 and we're in chapter 12 of of Matthew comparing it in a sense and contrasting it with chapter 12 of Genesis not because of the numbers but the content and now we look at we see the numbers saying hmm something very interesting there but now verse 48 where he answers who is my who is my mother and who are my brothers, this indicates that the heavenly king, Samayawi Nagus, he forsook his relationship in the flesh. He forsook his relationship in the flesh with the Judahites or with the Jews, as we too, his, his native, his kindred. So we see uh, an overlapping of what Abraham was called to, to come to, as we are being called, to come out of, Babylon, what come out of her, my people. See, that's the key right there. So, Yah can ask, well, who are my people? My people are those who seek to do my will. He didn't say, well, all black folks come out, or, or all African Americans, or all West Indians, or all Jamaicans, or all so-called Rastas come out. He says, come out of her, my people. So it's not even limited in that sense to a particular a particular ethnical, remember it says that all are not Israel who are of Israel. So even some of the flesh and blood Israel, those who may be our color, may not be our kind, and therefore are not our kindred by the highest, by the highest reference point, and that's the reference point of the King of Kings and Christ. Now, he forsook that flesh relationship. In this chapter, the Jews or the, the Judahites rejected the Moshiach, like the Ethiopians, in a sense, rejected his majesty. Having reached his climax, it caused Christos to forsake them fully, to forsake them completely. At this point, the break between them and the Moshiach began, at this particular point in, in, in Matthew. Matthew's gospel, and they were severed, and they were severed from Moshiach. They were severed from Moshiach. Now, we have to understand that the, the Jews or the Judahites of that time were not like these white folks or OJs today, but they were black peoples. You understand? They were Ethiopian Hebrew peoples. They were black peoples, like I and I. A lot of folks say, well, the ones who rejected him, they were the white Jews. You understand? Thinking that, like it is today, then it was in that particular time. You understand? You have to recognize that where white Judaism really gains its foothold is that something called the Council of Jamina. The Council of Jamina, when the Romans gave 
certain um, certain non-ethnic Jews the right to start Judaism in the present form that it is. So modern Judaism originates, European Judaism originates, and we're not even saying the Sephardics. The Sephardics have deeper roots than the Ashkenazis. The Ashkenazis are A.D. rooted. The Sephardic are B.C. rooted, just like the Ethiopian Hebrews and I and I. But there's a severing at this point. Now, verse 50 says, he says, for who ever does the will of my father who is in the heavens he is my brother and sister and mother because we only have one father in that sense father god father hashem after breaking with the judahites christos or the moshiach he turned to the they say he turned to the gentiles he turned to the gentiles or he turned to those who would receive the truth Thenceforth, his relationship with his followers was not in the flesh or according to the, the ethnic-only relationship, but in the spirit. Whoever does the will of his father, whoever does the will of Yeshua's father, is a brother who helps him, is a brother who assists him a sister who sympathizes with him, and a mother who tenderly loves him. More to come, my brothers and sisters. Shalom. Rastafari.